On this Friday night, Doug Ford drops a bomb on Toronto politics and leaves the mayor fuming. His sudden decision to slash Toronto City Council almost in half three months before voting day is just the latest controversial move from the new premier. So how much has Ontario changed in just 28 short days? Also tonight, the explosive California wildfire taking down everything in its path and the chaotic rush to get tens of thousands of people out of harm's way. Plus, he saw his girlfriend gunned down. Their lives changed forever. Tonight, we go with him back to the Danforth. This is The National. Ontario's new premier was, a, was once a single-term city councillor in Toronto. And today, Doug Ford made it very clear what he thinks of his former colleagues. People are tired of watching City Hall. It's like a comedy show down at City Hall. They go around and around and around. Nothing gets done. Ford's plan to change that cut down the number of councillors. Now, the ranks were actually due to grow from 44 to 47. Instead, they'll drop by almost half to 25. That's 20-odd 20 seats gone, their ward boundaries overhauled to align with federal ridings. Toronto's downtown core could see the most change. And think about it. Come election time, almost every sitting councillor will now have to duke it out with other incumbent councillors. Ford says it's about saving money, $25 million over four years. But it's how he's going about it which may be the biggest issue here. As Ron Charles shows us, his approach has ticked a number of people off. When Doug Ford was a Toronto City Councillor, he and his brother, Mayor Rob Ford, waged a pitched battle against most of the city's elected representatives. Rob Ford's crack-smoking admission and other scandals led city councillors to strip him of much of his mayoral power. The Ford brothers often called for council to be cut in half. Today, as Premier Ford is forcing the issue. It is the most dysfunctional political arena in the country, City Hall. The reason it's so dysfunctional, we have 44 people trying to make a decision. Doug Ford himself ran for mayor of Toronto and lost in 2014. The man who beat him, Mayor John Tory, is furious at Ford's surprise announcement. What we don't need and what I just can't support is change being rammed down our throats without a single second of public consultation. And on top of that, done in the middle of the election period itself. That municipal election is in just three months, leaving incumbents and hundreds of candidates unsure of where or if they will be running. The optics of Ford's move raise questions. It smacks of peak when you try and meddle in uh, the affairs of uh, somebody who defeated you. And that's, uh, that's what's happening with John Tory, and I'm sure he's uh, quite put out. And it doesn't... Uh, it's not a very good sign for the future relations between uh, the City Hall in Toronto and the Ford government. Ontario's opposition NDP leader questioned Ford's motives as well. He is taking vengeance on his former political opponents. He's behaving in a very mean-spirited way. And his bullying approach to politics is odious. Protesters showed up tonight outside Toronto City Hall, while inside, the council meeting descended into anger during the debate about the city's response. Who knew about this in advance? Because it has been suggested that somebody knew about this in advance and didn't bring it to our attention. I apologize to me and to this chamber for getting up and in that kind of... That, that, that way where you're just kind of implying it but not saying it. Get up if you have the balls to do it and say it. The mayor says he's considering the city's options, everything from a referendum to a court challenge. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Now, this made waves beyond just Toronto. Calgary's mayor, not one to hold back, was pretty critical of Ford's timing and more. For you to say to those folks who put their lives on hold only because they want to do public service, by the way, the job that you're running for doesn't exist anymore, that's unconscionable. Uh, and I stand with Mayor Tory on this and say that is a direct affront on democracy. That is tin pot dictator stuff. The concern to democracy is about representation. Can 25 councillors properly represent a city of almost 3 million and growing? 
That means one councillor would represent about 112,000 constituents. The closest Canadian comparison we could find is actually Calgary. One councillor for every 84,000 people. And compare that to Montreal, which has 65 city council members. That's one for every 26,000 people. And that range, perhaps, is Ford's point, that it doesn't matter how many councillors a city has, good governance will overcome. And he points to Los Angeles as an example. And when I told the city councillors in Los Angeles we had 44 councillors and we had about 2.8 million people roughly, they looked at me like we had three heads. Now, Ford is right about L.A. It has 15 city councillors for a population of 4 million. That's one councillor per 265,000 residents. But is that more efficient, cost-effective? Well, that's where it gets a little complicated. A Los Angeles city councillor makes a little over $240,000 Canadian per year. A Toronto councillor makes less than half that, $112,000. And on average, LA councillors have 19 staff members who, of course, are paid and can help manage workload. Toronto, the average is three to four staff. Now, on the flip side to all of this, Ford and his supporters would say this is simply what he was elected to do, change things for Ontarians. And in less than a month on the job, he can point to quite a number of major policy changes. For starters, Ford's government struck a deal with Ontario's utility, Hydro One, which led to its CEO and board resigning. Ford is also phasing out Ontario's cap-and-trade program, which forced large companies to pay for carbon dioxide emissions. On the education front, Ford rolled back the sexual education curriculum to the old program, one that doesn't teach about consent, gender identity, or online safety. And just yesterday, media reports suggested he's going to allow private retailers to sell cannabis once it becomes legal. So look, things are moving quick, and there's very likely more to come. So let's get some insight on Ford's strategy from Ginny Roth. Ginny, you're a senior consultant at Crestview Strategy, a conservative strategist, and uh, we should say your husband works for a current provincial minister. So, so Ginny, tell us, what should the public understand about how Doug Ford is operating here? Uh, well, he's moving quickly because he has a mandate to do so. Uh, the voters elected him to make change, and he's making a lot of change. Uh, and I think people are going to like it because he's got this single-minded focus on getting things done quickly and making sure that it's for the people. That was his, that was his mandate, that's his approach, that he, that's what he's told all his cabinet, and that's the kind of lens that he's approaching all of his decision-making with. But can you do it this quickly and, and still get it right? I think you can, because he's got a mandate for it, and, and, and he's uh, pretty dogged in saying, uh, if we don't see results on the ground, if people don't see their gas, ta gas prices go down, if they don't see fewer politicians instead of uh, more, if they don't see the size of, and cost of government uh, going down, then we're not doing things right. And if they don't see it quickly, uh, then they won't get the mandate that they asked for when they voted for us. Uh, uh, so there could be some risks. Um, you know, some of these cabinet ministers are new, uh, they're learning on the job. Uh, uh, but so long as you see this discipline, I think it's always worth leaning forward as he's doing uh, and, and getting results. So, so then set the table for us and, and, and look forward uh, for us in terms of what you think might be coming down the pipe that, that perhaps may have as big of a, a splash as, as today's announcement. Sure. So they've packed a lot in. They've, they've, they're repealing cap and trade. They're repealing sex ed. Um, they're moving forward. Uh, uh, and, and, and the big piece that's coming, I think, is uh, financial. On the budget, uh, on the, uh, the fall economic statement, they've looked at the books. They're, they have a commission that's looking into the size and cost of government, some of the rampant waste that we saw from the last government. And I don't think the report's going to be good. Uh, and that's going to mean that they're going to have to dig in and find those savings. But that's what they were elected for, and I think people are looking forward to it. Okay, Ginny Roth with Crestview Strategy. Thanks very much for joining us. And in just a few moments on The National, we'll take you to Northern California, where officials say a fast-moving wildfire is just 3% contained. Homes are burning. Also, after a tough two weeks for Donald Trump, some good news and an economic update. Are his international trade spats helping him at home? But first, something that hits very close to home. An emotional moment on the Danforth tonight in Toronto. I love this neighborhood and I can't believe that happened here. And I have a little son and he even noticed that something had happened. He said, why is the street taped off? And that's heartbreaking for me. 
And so she returned to the Danforth this evening to join in a moment of silence organized by the businesses that line that lively strip and their employees. The latest step on a long road back to normal. And it will be a long road, especially for people like Danielle Kane, a nursing student with an instinct to help others. She was the one being cared for today as doctors performed her fourth surgery. Kane was with her boyfriend, Jerry Pinkson, Sunday night when she was shot. And today, the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen joined Pinkson on the Danforth as he made the difficult journey back to the spot where everything changed. I thought it'd be best to come here and, uh, and just, to, just to see the site and see if I can just start the healing process a little bit, a little bit quicker. Jerry Pinkson and his girlfriend, Danielle Kane, used to love the Danforth. But last Sunday, it's where their lives were changed forever. Kane was shot in the abdomen. The bullet pierced her stomach and diaphragm and shattered a vertebra. Her family fears she may never walk again. I want to make sure that people know her sacrifice. Pinkson says Kane followed him out of the restaurant that night to help someone who was injured. That's when she was shot. I initially, I felt a lot of, a lot of uh, guilt because like it was my initial decision to go outside to, to help the wounded. Like I'm the one who, I'm the one who did this. Like I'm, I made the decision to go out and she, and she got injured. She was the person who wants to help too. Yes, that's why I fell in love with her. That's, that's why I love her so much because she's such a compassionate and selfless person. After her cousin first shared Kane's story with The National last night, there's been an outpouring of support for Kane online. A GoFundMe page was set up by her family to help pay for rehab, specialized care, and accessible housing. When I hear all these kind words, these stories of Danielle, which I know she's that person, it just reinforces how much I love her. It just, it just builds me up and, and it allows me to keep going. How are you feeling coming up to the restaurant? I, I think I'm ready. I think I'm, I think I want to see it. Well, we are here. We were right here. You're outside. On a patio. And this is, this is the exit where uh, we came out of. Why is it important to get yourself back here to see this, to face this. It, it helps to talk about it. It, it, it helps to lessen the, the anger and helps him lessen the fear. And hopefully, like, when Danielle's ready and able, I want to bring Danielle back here. I want Danielle to see it. I want us to heal together. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Late today, we got word from Danielle's family about today's surgery. Her fourth, as I mentioned, since she was shot. They said the surgery was a huge success. This is likely her final surgery. They're starting to wean her off the ventilator and decrease sedation. Hopefully she will be able to speak by Monday. The next step will be rehabilitation. Okay, let's take you west to California now, where a fast-moving wildfire has killed two people. It's known as the Car Fire, burning in the state's north, and that wall of flames being fueled by dry conditions and extremely hot temperatures. The fire's already burned down dozens of buildings, and it's now surging towards major residential areas. That had emergency officials putting out an urgent plea for people in Redding, about three hours north of Sacramento, and places nearby as well. The warning to evacuate immediately. This is just some of what's being posted online. You see the night sky aglow with orange and red flames as the fire tore through the mountains west of Redding. It is the region's largest city, so pretty scary stuff. And now imagine having just moved in. My coworkers were like, oh, the fire is coming. And everybody from California is like pretty used to fires. So me being from the Midwest, who's not used to fires, I immediately was like, freaking out and I was like crying and I was like what if it comes here and like I lose all my stuff like I have to go get my things I keep going through things that I forgot to bring and I'm like oh man like and there's stupid things but I just keep thinking about it and I'm like ah. that's Sarah Day she's originally from Detroit she moved to Reading just a few months ago right into the path of the fire I was really afraid um 
my family lives in the Midwest and I was really afraid that like if I wasn't prepared that I would never see them again. And um it was just it was just like I didn't want to be caught under unaware. I wanted to plan like it's my first time I've ever had to do anything like this cuz like in the Midwest we get the occasional tornado and a blizzard and at this point I'm like guys a blizzard's way better than a fire like come on. They say it's like really really bad and for Californians to say that it's bad means it's really bad. So right now she's in a safe place, but that fire's still burning and will for some time. It's just 3% contained, and the weather isn't expected to offer any relief in the coming days. It's bad news for the nearly 2,000 firefighters on hand. Now, a number of wildfires are also burning on this side of the border. There are air quality statements in B.C., and in Ontario, there are at least a dozen wildfires. Have a look. These are pictures of the fire burning near Perry Sound, south of Sudbury. This one is almost 7,000 hectares in size. An Alberta firefighter was also killed battling a wildfire north of Thunder Bay in Ontario. He died while trying to protect the town of Red Lake. And here's a look at what else we're tracking tonight. Charges have been laid in what police are calling a hate-motivated crime. The altercation caught on video. If I do something if you do something to me, what, in my province? Hey, 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 hey. It happened Monday evening. The man appearing on the video to yell racist insults at a family and pushing one of them, too. 50-year-old Lombre Ball appeared in court this morning on charges of assault and uttering death threats. JCA Sweeters is going to court. I've taken him to court. It was my ticket. Yeah, this Nova Scotia woman has followed through on her threat. She is suing her nephew over a $1.2 million Chase the Ace jackpot. Barb Reddick's name was on the winning ticket, but so was her nephew's. So when they won, the charity running the contest split the prize right down the middle. But Reddick says she paid for the ticket and her nephew's name was only written on it for good luck. And stargazers from Europe to Australia got quite a treat today. The longest total lunar eclipse any human will see this century lasted an hour and 42 minutes. That's the Earth right between the sun and the full moon in a straight line, giving the moon that deep red color, which is why folks call it a blood moon. You won't see one as long as today's for another 100 years or so in the year 2123. Okay, still ahead on The National. Why you'll start seeing more sizes in more clothing stores. As always, it's all about the bottom line. Plus, a very British ad campaign made in Canada. Our first look at the targeted Brexit ads made by Canadian company AIQ that some say swayed the vote. And a 13-year-old from Toronto wows the crowd on U.S. national television. I was nervous. Combination of nervousness and excitement. And... All I wanted to do was to sing my excitement. Ask Donald Trump who deserves credit for a surge in the U.S. economy, and he'll say he does. That won't surprise a heck of a lot of people. But this time, even some of his biggest detractors admit he might be right. New numbers released today show that from April through June this year, the U.S. economy grew at its fastest pace since 2014. But as the CBC's Lindsay Duncombe tells us, many are now asking, how long can it last? Summertime and the spending is easy in this high-end shopping complex in downtown D.C., I'm not going out to buy a Rolls Royce or something like that, but I feel comfortable that if I need to buy a new car, I can make a payment and I can buy some luxury items, go out to dinner a couple times a week type of thing. Consumer confidence is one of the reasons U.S. GDP grew 4.1% in the last three months, nearly double growth in the first quarter of 2018, the strongest expansion in four years. Economy watchers conclude... A very good, solid picture. Good morning. Moments ago, so good, Donald Trump held an impromptu celebratory growth. announcement at the White House. These numbers are very, very sustainable. This isn't a one-time shot. 
That's where many economists disagree. They worry all that spending is a one-time effect of January's tax cut and point out that some of that growth is due to preparations for Trump's trade showdowns, with countries buying up products such as soybeans before tariffs kick in. Even the president's supporters praise him with an asterisk. For many Americans, we're having the best economy of our lifetimes, and it's mainly due uh, to President Trump. I just hope we don't blow it all on a global trade war. That's where the uncertainty comes in. The full effect of trade conflicts with China, the EU and Canada hasn't kicked in yet. Trump is already trying to mitigate the impact, just this week, dialing back the rhetoric with the EU and promising new trade talks and announcing a $12 billion bailout package for farmers. It's a step in the right direction that helps farmers a little bit, uh, but really we'd rather get paid by the market than have a government bailout. One thing is certain about today's numbers, and that's that there's something Republicans can campaign on. The next quarterly report does not come out until 11 days before the midterm elections. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. An update now to a story we brought you last month. A Mexican reporter and his son are now free after spending months in U.S. federal detention. Emilio Gutierrez and his son, Oscar, they were overjoyed. Mijo. Mi hijo ha sido, ha sido mi inspiración. Gutierrez says his son gave him the inspiration to carry on. And make no mistake, it has been a slog. The two of them fled persecution in Mexico and have been trying to get asylum for a decade. But last December, they were suddenly imprisoned by immigration officials. Earlier this year, Adrian spoke with both of them inside that detention center. And you can have another look at our full documentary on our YouTube channel. And still ahead, right here. They shipped T-shirts from Humboldt, Saskatchewan, all over the world, and their emotional moment is our moment of the day. Plus, a special CBC short doc about the place hundreds of people in Calgary called home and what they did when the city decided to evict them. Well, and I look at the golf course, I say you've got three, 400 people living in this park, and you've got six people on the golf course covering about 5,000 acres. And they have no place for us. Ridiculous. On The National tonight, a surprising new star in the next Star Wars movie, the late Carrie Fisher. Disney announced today that they'll be using unreleased footage of her shot for Star Wars The Force Awakens. Fisher died in 2016 at the age of 60. The day after Facebook's stock took a slide, Twitter's did the same. And that's despite quarterly results showing a rise in revenue. The problem, a drop in active users. And so the company's shares lost more than 20% of their value after that news came out. The online platform recently deleted many fake accounts. Meanwhile, Facebook shareholders are suing the company over its record-breaking stock drop yesterday. They're accusing Facebook and CEO Mark Zuckerberg of misleading investors about how well the company was actually doing and things like the decline in active users and slowing revenue growth. Well, you likely first heard about the BC company Aggregate IQ earlier this year. It's alleged links to the controversial firm Cambridge Analytica and its role in the Brexit referendum. It was hired to provide online ads for the Leave campaign ahead of that vote. But now, for the first time, the wider public is getting a look at those ads. As Thomas Daigle tells us, it's raising a number of ethical questions. Folkestone, Southeast England, a town that hugs the English Channel. With France so close, you can see its faint coast in the distance. This may be Britain's gateway to the mainland, but it doesn't mean people here feel connected to Europe. In fact, the majority of voters in Folkestone chose Brexit. I felt it was more about sovereignty, about our, our national identity, really. Who among them would have known a company in British Columbia was swaying votes here by spreading questionable claims. Yeah. Did you see this I mean, number during the campaign? 350 yes, yeah, million a week? Yeah, and that, <laughs> that was everywhere, you know. That don't sound right, does it? No. 
but yet but people still, believed it. I know, but, but, but where was that brain at the time? The Vote Leave campaign poured millions into Aggregate IQ, based all the way in Victoria. Now we know what Facebook ads they pumped out in return. This one suggests Britain sends 350 million pounds a week to the EU, enough to build a new hospital every seven days, it says. There's the threat of Turkey and its whole population moving to the UK, and the dubious claim the EU wants to kill Britain's beloved cup of tea. There should be a challenge from the advertising regulators in this country. MP Damien so Collins and his parliamentary committee just obtained copies of the ads from Facebook. Here is you take a relatively small company uh, from Canada that has not worked in the UK before, and they are the main advertiser for the, for the Vote Leave campaign. Uh, it's never been really clear how that introduction was made. Sometimes it can be impossible to tell that these are political ads just by looking at them. They can seem like a poll or even a game. This supposed soccer quiz to win 50 million pounds was actually only meant to collect user data. These were like the believe adverts. Shamir Sani witnessed it from the inside as a campaign volunteer. The people responsible for that need to be accounted for, and we can't allow that to happen. And one, you can't allow the law to be broken, and two, you can't allow disinformation to spread. The Brexit campaign has been over for two years. Still, no one knows how many lies may have affected the outcome. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, Folkestone, England. Well, CBC News has been trying to reach Aggregate IQ for comment on this story. We have not heard back from the company so far. It's still hit on The National. More sizes in more stores. The trend towards inclusive sizing. We're not a plus size brand. We are a brand of apparel for women, and I really strongly believe that that is the future. If your home means anything to you, you have to fight for it. If you're not willing to fight for it out of your home, you don't deserve it. This is the story about losing things that matter most. A community, a sense of belonging, the place you've called home for 50 years. To hundreds of people in Calgary, Midfield Mobile Home Park was just such a place. But when the city decided to close it, blaming crumbling infrastructure, some residents dug in for a fight. Perhaps none more so than 83-year-old Rudy Prediger. Tonight on The National, you're going to meet him in a CBC short doc called Eviction notice. You know, I'm in my 80s and I don't plan on getting rich. And my, like my daughter said to me one time, she jokes with me all the time, my youngest daughter. She said, Dad, give me some of your money. I said, why? She said, you can't take it with you. I said, then I'm not going. They want this land. Some people are estimating it's worth 90 million. Some are saying 60 million. This is my home. I spent $25,000 last year uh, putting a new roof and upgrading the whole thing, new siding. And first, just walk away with it, you know? I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense. This tree here, I planted that when it was about a foot and a half high. And the city one day is going to come in here and hit my tree with a bulldozer. Well, and I look at the golf course, I say, you got three, 400 people living in this park. And you got six people on the golf course covering about 5,000 acres. And they have no place for us. Ridiculous. I'm not telling them to remove uh, uh, the golf course. I'm telling them to remove themselves from our way of life. If they don't like it, don't treat us like trailer trash. If you play nice, they'll walk all over you, you know. The only thing that's going to save us is the press and the media and, uh, you know, you have to embarrass them. 
The future of Midfield Park has been up in the air since the early 2000s when concerns surfaced over failing water and sewer lines. And you cannot fix the sewer pipes without removing the house because of the way the original developer built that land. The land is city owned and civic officials would prefer the valuable property to be used for high density mixed use developments. Look at this, goes back to 2006. Rudy Prediger leads a community co-op, and as he watches his property value drop, Prediger says there's only one deal he will accept. To get out of here and leave us alone. There's quite a few people in here that think that they're just going to be able to walk up to a lawyer and uh, fight and stay in here. And Rudy's filling everybody's heads full of, oh, we're going to save this part. We're going to save this part. He's not saving shit. It's, it's going to be taken, period. You're going to lose your home. There is no more fight. There is no more time. Now I'm going to miss it. Closed midfield. We, under the Mobile Home Tenancies Act, had to give one year's notice. We said that wasn't fair. We gave three. No compensation was payable. We said that wasn't fair. So everyone's getting $10,000 cash plus help with their moving expenses. Plus, of course, they still own their homes. So of the 183 homes at midfield, I believe about 150 have moved already. About 40 uh, have plans to move before the end of the month. About 10 we have not heard from yet. The year ago, I was I started to have pains and everything. Then I finally went and got checked out. And after a month or so of diagnosis and stuff, uh, I found out I had stomach cancer. So I went back to work and said, well, I can't work now because I've got other issues to deal with. And left work and came home here and I walked into the front door. And that's when our notice was on the front door saying that we have to leave here at the end of September. So then I just kind of threw that aside because I had other issues to work on right now because I was in a lot of pain and everything. So we got through that. Now we got to get through this. now have a lawyer working on their behalf. Matthew Farrell took the Park residence case to court today. At a hearing booked in November, Farrell will argue the city's reasons for evicting the residents, crumbling water and sewer infrastructure, goes against the province's Mobile Home Sites Tenancy Act. We're here to go in front of the judge and find out which way things are going to go. And how are you feeling about your chances? I always feel good about it, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> the key thing here is, and, and the, the thing that the judge is going to be deciding in this application, is whether or not what the city did was wrong. For the people who are still there, uh, obviously the hope is that they're still going to continue to be there. Like, they don't understand what stress does to a person. It's killing us. It's killing us. I don't want to see anymore. I'm going to start crying. I want, to, I want to say that I... Monday, 10, 52 a.m. Hi there. Uh, I tried you two or three times. Uh, I left a message before, but you had not call back. So give me a call back. 
I think that's because I was laying on a cold floor for so long. I think of about 30 hours. I don't want to be in some home. You know, if I'm going to die, I'll do it at home. gone in the hospital. When I come home, I went and lay down on the bed and she laid down beside me and something woke me up and I looked here, she's right here licking my nose. <laughs> Laying on the bed and licking my nose, she was glad that I come back. <laughs> hey, hello. Hey, Uncle. So are you gonna fill me in on everything that happened down at the courthouse? just heard on the radio here that the judge ordered everybody out by next February. That's all I know. Yeah, that's uh, just the news you needed to hear today, huh? planning on retiring here and spending the rest of my years here. But anytime you have anything to do with this city, you know, they'll dig your grave up if they want that land. me in my life for being outspoken. But if I think somebody being treated wrong, I speak up. It's just the way I am. It's like uh, one guy told me one time, I like a good licking once in a while. I said, why? He said, it feels so good when they quit. In the end, 183 homes were removed or destroyed. More than 400 people forced out, and the land still sits vacant. As for some of the people that you just met, Rudy Prediger did find a new place to live, another mobile home park just on the outskirts of Calgary. Mark Van Essen, whose sense of defeat you saw towards the start of that story, he moved to Red Deer, Alberta. And sadly, Maurice Lavoie, the man with stomach cancer, he passed away shortly after the documentary was completed. If you want to watch the full version of Eviction Notice, what you saw was just a shortened version, you can head to cbc.ca slash short docs. There you'll also find other documentaries from emerging Canadian filmmakers. When it comes to buying plus-sized clothing, it's not always easy because finding something that fits is just one part of it. You also want something stylish and affordable, and increasingly, major stores are catching on, and to an extent that we haven't really seen before. Because as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson shows us, in fashion, plus-size might be the new black. 
Right. Daniela Lombardi and Sarah DiMillo love fashion, but they have often felt that the industry just does not love them back. I had to make my dress because it, no prom dresses fit me. So everyone got to go shopping for prom dresses, mm -hmm. and my mother made my prom dress. Yeah, like the, the things that are out there in our sizes are very low quality. It's not Lombardi and DiMillo are among one third of women in Canada and 16 million women in North America who need plus sized clothing. A long neglected demographic in an industry whose mantra has been the smaller the better. I don't know what you expect me to do. There's nothing in this whole closet that'll fit a size six, I can guarantee you. But now it looks like their fashion fortunes are changing. Mainstream retailers are getting the message. Women above size 14 don't want to shop at specialty stores only, something Canadian Alexandra Waldman figured out years ago. The idea of, of separating women, of segregating some women from, from access to style and quality um, have got to stop. When influential American retailer J. Crew decided to extend its size range, it turned to Waldman for expertise. The company she co-founded, Universal Standard, carries sizes 6 to 32, with a focus on the latest trends and the highest quality. Its new collection, together with J. Crew, has 37 pieces in sizes up to 5X. They wanted to create um, a new way for, for all women to shop which was much more inclusive and much more diverse in terms of size. We're not a plus size brand. We are a brand of apparel for women. And I really strongly believe that that is the future. There's good indication that it is. Like J. Crew, many other popular fashion brands are going size inclusive. You can see it in their catalogs, where models of bigger and smaller frames are now shown side by side. And in their stores, where bigger sizes are no longer segregated. A welcome change for Daniela Lombardi. It's kind of degrading. It's like, not degrading, but it's just like, okay, you guys can stay on the main floor with all the designers and labels, and I'll just take the escalator up to... The, the section, the plus section. Yeah. Behind this shift in thinking, money. Plus size purchases amount to close to $2 billion in sales in Canada each year and more than $20 billion in the U.S. And it's growing. It's something big retailers can no longer ignore, says fashion business analyst Imran Ahmed. I think, you know, the economic opportunity alone has been, you know, one of the most important drivers. So you think that assumption makes sense? Yeah. And Imran Ahmed says these retailers are also aware of the changing set of values. I think now that, you know, we all have voices on social media, we all, you know, there's this um, ability for people to express what they think. And I think the demand has always been there. It's now just a lot more evident. Women like Lombardi and Demilo, who both do plus size modeling, are part of that change. They're part of a four-woman group who call themselves the Canadian Curvies, and their Instagram followers number in the hundreds of thousands. While they're happy with the new attention major fashion retailers are showing them, they won't settle for just anything. It's not just a matter of cutting it and saying, okay, it's going to fit you because we made it three times bigger. No. I call it subtle drama, which I... Fashion insiders agree. Retailers will face some tough challenges ahead. It's much more expensive to make a dress that's a size 32 because... It's five times the material that a size zero is, but the price to the consumer has to be the same. I'm done justifying my size, my curves. Part of the steep learning curve for the fashion industry as it tries to woo the curvier customer. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And coming up next on The National, our moment of the day. But first, an Ontario teen is showing the world it's not just Americans who've got talent. He performed in front of millions on the hit TV show. My name is Jeffrey Lee. I'm 13 years old. Jeffrey wowed the judges with his singing on America's Got Talent. And not to jinx it, but he said he even knows what he'd do with the million dollar prize if he wins. I'm the only child, so I would love a companion. Um, I guess, I guess a dog. <laughs> no pressure, but before uttering even a single note, Jeffrey did manage a small win, a promise from music mogul and judge Simon Cowell. If you do well, I'm going to buy you a dog. Thank you.
Jeffrey's rendition of Josh Groban's You Raise Me Up won the crowd over. And it earned him a spot in the next round of competition, plus, yes, a furry friend. I'm gonna keep my promise. Not only have you got four yeses, you just got yourself a new job. Jeffrey's round one performance aired in June and already has 12 million views. He can't say what happened in round two or how far he got in the competition because it hasn't aired yet. But for now, he's still waiting for that new dog. Well, as you can see, there's no barking around here. In the wake of tragedy, people often look for ways they can help. We've been seeing it with the Danforth shooting this past week, but also after the Humboldt Broncos bus crash back in April. That's when one business owner decided to make T-shirts with a simple message, we are Humboldt Strong. And now, almost four months later, he presented a check to the Humboldt Strong Community Foundation, and that is our moment of the day. When we decided to launch this campaign, we thought we'd print just a few hundred shirts. Over the course of the first three weeks of April after the accident, uh, we were selling thousands of t-shirts online. We have shipped uh, to date to every province in Canada, almost every state in the United States, other countries like um, Dubai, Finland, Switzerland, Germany, uh, and, and so many more. We know the t-shirt means a lot to people out there. It's a way to show you belonging. It's a, show, it's a way to honor those victims. So at the end of the day, we had a check for $304,239.90 to the Humboldt Strong Community Foundation. $300,000, so that's donating $20 on every $25 shirt. You do the math, that's a lot of shirts. That's The National for this July 27th. Have a good night.